The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning and welcome, Southside Bible Church. If you're visiting, we are grateful to have you here with us to worship our God. We're currently in a series preparing our hearts for Christmas, and my desire is that we would see the beauty and the fullness of the glory that was born into the world, that blessed Christmas morning. My heart has been overwhelmed in my studies at the wisdom and the glory of God, and I pray that He's doing the same uh, in your hearts. I'm encouraged to see how many of you are redeeming this time richly with taking your kids through devotionals at this time, as David mentioned, the one by John Piper. Paul David Tripp has another one. There's some great ones out there, and just really encourage you to redeem this time uh, with kids. So parents, keep at it. What a privilege to train them and show them the glories and the beauties of the king that was born into this world. And if you've got nieces and nephews or nursing homes, neighbors, workmates, I just proclaim this truth. Get out there and tell it. Just a reminder, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service at 445 where the focus will just be on the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So get to the highways and byways and do the work of an evangelist and tell them of the good news. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ has been born into the world that he created. So let's go to our God and pray and ask that he will bless our time in this word. Father, I do pray uh, that you would begin drawing men and women and children to yourself during this season. God, I pray that our eyes and ears would be open and attentive. For there are many even in our own midst right now who are hurting greatly with loss of loved ones and the things that they are facing. God, I pray for your comfort to their hearts even now. I pray for all those who are hurting in this world. They're sitting in darkness. And the sunrise from on high has come into this world. He's the light of the world. And I pray that we would be diligent to enter into the hurts and the needs and the brokenness of those we live in the midst of. God, open us up. Open our eyes up to see this world the way you see. Give us the eyes of Christ. Give us the heart of Christ. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. God, let us cry and have a heart for these lost people. God, give us compassion and humility and truthfulness and love as we engage this world. So I pray during this season that you would use many sitting in this room to be your instruments to bring the truth of the gospel to minds and hearts and salvation. God, awaken us to apathy and to just being focused on our own kingdom. God, open our eyes to the great kingdom that you've brought us into. I pray that you would use this time in a powerful way. Lord, I pray now for the passage of Scripture that we will now open up. As David said, let it now be a time of worship. God, let us worship you in this word, and we pray that you will take these truths and you will open our minds to understand and our hearts would have great affection toward Christ, and our will would be wholly, solely inclined to do his will. And so God, do what no man can do now. We look to you, your spirit, and this word that you have inspired. Please now illuminate it to the hearers here this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning will be part three in our series that we've been doing to get our hearts prepared uh, for Christmas. And I just want to review those first two points. The first one was in Genesis 3.15, where we began looking at, at the seed. And in that context was the fall of all of humanity, where the devil came and tempted Adam and Eve away from submission and trust to God. And, and as he's cursing the devil for what he did, right in the middle of it, it was, it was like God couldn't hold back this glorious gospel, his gift to the world, his, his John 3.16. Here it is. He says, I will put enmity... Between you and the woman, which is the whole history of the world now, there's two seeds, there's two kingdoms now that are fighting. And they're between your seed and her seed. 
He, so this he, who's he? Well, we saw it was Jesus Christ. He's going to come and be that seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. He's going to undo the works of the devil and what he did there in the garden, in the next garden of Gethsemane. And so Jesus Christ will come and, and bring healing to what the devil did. And then we proceeded into Genesis 12. And now the Lord said to Abram, verses 1 through 3, Go forth from your country, you idol worshiper, and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed." And we looked at that seed that would come from Abraham and that seed being singular would be the Lord Jesus Christ and in him all the nations now will be blessed as they call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as he's in gathering now the nations. And now this morning we're going to turn our focus onto the promise that God will make to King David. So if you'll turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is about a house that he's going to build now through his seed. So we keep following this seed, and we saw it's going to come from Abraham, and now it's going to come through David. David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. And as we begin this study this morning, I want to set some really important context for us in understanding the great promise that that God is going to make to David. In the garden, we, we saw creation when we began this series, and in creation, God was king. He ruled over his creation that he made. And then the fall came. And the fall is now we want to be king over our own little domain. We want to be kings. We want to be gods and rule. And then we saw that God called Abraham to start a great nation, the people of God, where he would begin working out this plan of redemption and salvation. And they were going to be ruled by God himself, his very presence that they're going to follow and he's going to be the king and the leader. And then through Moses, God would establish his rule and his conduct of how this nation should live. And it's going to center on the worship of God. And he would be their God and they will be his people. It's it's beautiful. And so the Israelites were his kingdom on earth. To be the people of God, you had to belong to the covenant people. If you wanted to come in, you had to become proselytes and get circumcised. And that's how you came into the kingdom. And then God brings this people into a promised land flowing with milk and honey in the land of Canaan. And yet in just a few generations now, all that God did to deliver that nation through the Red Sea and the plagues and all of that, it's going to be forgotten. And they're going to become like all the other pagan nations surrounding them and worshiping in sin and all that will take place. And then God's going to bring judgments upon the nation. He's going to bring them to their surrounding neighbors, through the Midianites and the Philistines, and they will come upon Israel and conquer and fight them. And Israel then would cry out for forgiveness. We've sinned against you, God. And God would relent, and he would raise up a judge for them to lead them, and they would conquer their enemy, and then they would renew their covenantal vows to the king. And then a few generations would come and go, and they would forget again. And they would repent, and God would relent and judge, and then there would be the vows again of faithfulness as he was raised up a judge. And there's seven cycles of it again and again and again. Judges is such a discouraging book. It closes in those days that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel. And so everyone just did whatever they thought or felt was good, a a picture of a day in America. But then the story continues to advance. And the people of Israel say, we want a king. We want to be like the other pagan nations. They have kings that lead and go into battle. And we we want to be like them. And God says, okay, choose a man and anoint him as king. And they pick this strapping young lad who's a head taller than anyone else. And he's handsome. And his name is Saul. And during his reign, he becomes corrupt paranoid, fearful, and an ungodly man. Any threat to his rule, he wants to kill that person, which would become David. And so just he's so paranoid, I don't want anyone taking my throne. 
After Saul's failure, God now raises up another king, and this time God picks. And he picks a man after his own heart by the name of David. And David was a great king, the best king Israel ever had. He was a great administrator, and he united the tribes, and he won every military battle he ever entered into, and he brought peace and prosperity to this nation through David. And that is where we take up then this morning, 2 Samuel 7. And as we unfold this section of Scripture, I want to do it by this following outline. Our first point is we're going to see in verses 1 through 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, that David's desire, he wants to build God a house. And then verses 8 through 11, God's going to say, uh uh-uh, I, I build houses. And then in verses 12 through 17, he tells us how he's going to build his house. And then in verses 18 through 29, if we have time this morning, we're going to see David's response then to God's initiative uh, to build this house. It's a beautiful, humble response of David. So let's take it up with our first point then. David desires to build God a house. Look with me in verse 1. Now it came about when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all of his enemies that the king said to Nathan the prophet, who's going to visit David in a few more chapters, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. So Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. And so they're, they're, they're gonna, things are going great under the rule of David. There's rest on every side. The, the man after God's own heart is being blessed. And they, they now have rest from all these cycles of judges and everything that was going on. Now there is, is rest all around. They've been conquered. And David, again, he's won every military victory that he's fought. The nation is united. David has built for himself now a really nice, I'm going to call it the White House. Okay, he's made a brilliant house for the king of Israel. And it's a house of cedar, one of the best woods you could ever have. It's a gorgeous wood. I love the smell of it. And his house is finished. Beautiful cedar house. And I don't know if it's out of guilt or just reverence. I'm, I think reverence. As David's like, oh, I got my house. It's all built. It's really nice. But wait a minute. God is dwelling in a tent. This is hundred of year, it's probably a hundred years, hundreds and hundreds of years old at this time, this tent. It's probably worn out. It's probably moldy. And I, I want to build God then a house as well. Here's my cedar house. God's in worn out tents. It's a great idea, right? Nathan says, go and do all that is in your heart. The Lord's with you. Good idea, David. Look in verse 4. But in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? And God says, Not not so fast. No, you're not going to build me a house. And he's going to give some reasons in verse 6. For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Have I ever even insinuated or said that to the Levites? Did I say, why don't you build me a house? No. No, and the Lord gives these beautiful reasons. I I call them incarnational reasons. I'm coming, I'm with you, and and there's this humility and this leadership of God. I, I live with my people. If my people wander, I wander with them. I'm not asking to live like a king. When my people have needs, I'm there and I I come and I follow. It's beautiful. Who's a God like ours? Kings rule from on high and they have great palaces and clothes and the finest foods. And our God is a God for the people, with the people. The most amazing words, I think, in the Bible, Luke 2, 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger 
because there was no room for them at the end, this humility of, of the, the, the most infinite plunge coming into a manger to come in humility to be with the people, to bring God and man back together. And I just see this incarnational purpose here with God and with Israel and saying, I, I've never asked for you to build me a house. I'm with my people. So David has a, a good desire to build God a house. The second point I want to look at this morning is that God says, I'm the one then who does the building in verses 8 through 11. Kind of a, a little flip of, of events now with David. Now, therefore, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Nathan, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. And I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly the history of Israel. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. So David, you went from the pasture <laughs> to the prince of my people. I made you that. From the daily care of the sheep, I've taken you now to care for my nation, the covenant people of God. You went from a lowly shepherd to king over God's chosen people. David, why? Why? Well, it was all of grace. It was my doings, my initiatives. David, I'm the one who's taken you and I'm building a kingdom. I'm, I'm the one doing this, okay? You're not going to do this for me. David, you do nothing for me, but you do everything through me. It's, it's all of grace. It's not you, David. All I could think of was Romans 11. Paul finishing the gospel, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back again? Who has built him a house instead of him building a house? For from him and through him and to him are all things. And this whole history of this world is to him be the glory forever. Amen. I've been reading a biography on John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace. The author of the book describes Newton's life like this. He said, one word provides a summary of his life and testimony and its grace. From start to finish, Newton's life in Christ was lived in grace. Grace was not only a defibrillator jolt at the beginning of his Christian life, but grace was the saving and restraining power of God at every stage. He said, if the Lord were to leave me one hour, I should fall into gross evil. I'm like a child who dares to go across Cheapside, it was a busy street, unless someone would hold his hand. For Newton, the Christian life could only be ex explained by God's sustaining grace. Grace saved his wretched soul. Grace sought him out. Grace removed his spiritual blindness and opened his spiritual eyes. Grace taught him to fear God, and grace relieved his fears. Grace led him to hope. The life and ministry of Newton can all fit under the banner of grace. God's abundant, all-sufficient, infinite, sovereign, unceasing, and amazing grace. Which is what I just see fill this passage this morning. I'm going to build a house. Too many are trying to build a house for God. Too many are trying to pay back grace. They're trying to do something so that they can show forth God's glory. And there's some good motive to that, and there can be some wrong ones. But what I've seen in my journey is the last thing that goes in most people's sanctification is us trying to build a house for God. I, I just meet person after person, I'm going to do this for God. Uh, your whole life is built on what you're going to do for God. 
And he's coming and he's saying, I'm going to build my house. And the last thing to go is when you'll finally just surrender all to God. And he's not looking for you to build him a house. I learned this week in ancient times, it was very common that a king would have military success. And then he would build his God a temple. And the priest then would come and say, since you have built God a temple, you're going to have eternal days. You're going to have God, your God's blessings. So if they built him a house, God would establish their power forever. And here David might be thinking the same thing. I'm going to build you a temple. And God says, no, (laughs) this is not like any other religion. You build God a house and he will bless you as every other religion. Go do this and God will bless you. And this kingdom that we are looking at and seeing that God is saying, I will build, it will be all of grace. It will be all of my doing. I will build a house. Remember 1 Peter? I'm going to take stones from every nation and I'm going to build the temple. I'll I'll build you a house. We saw last time the blessing of God with Abraham was received what? Unconditionally. God walked through the the cut up animals and everything. God is the one I will fulfill this covenant so I can bless the nations through my son. All religions are not the same, just a little bit different. This is utterly different from every religion for how you will approach God. We don't build a kingdom for God. God is building his own. You do not make his name great. I will make your name great, David. I'll make your name great. We don't do God a favor, but we respond to his favor. David desires to build God a house. In verses 8 through 11, God says, I'm going to be the one who builds the house. I took you as a little lowly shepherd, the lowest position in society, and I'm the one who's brought you to be the king over the nation of Israel. I'm the one, David, who makes things great. Now, in verses 12 through 17, our third point, well, God, how are you going to build this house? How will you build a house? I love this. David, you will not build me a house. I will build you a house. But get this, it's not a building. You already have your little cedar house. I'm talking about a dynasty, and I'm talking about a nation. I will commit myself to them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people This dynasty that I'm going to build, this house, he says three times in our passage now in these verses 12 through 17, is it'll be forever. I'm going to build a house that will last forever. And then in the the rest of these verses, he's going to show us three things that cannot bring this house to an end. This kingdom that God is going to build. He's going to say, death cannot bring it to an end. Sin cannot bring it to an end. And time, the passing of time, cannot bring this to an end. Well, I will not break my commitment to your descendants in building this house or this dynasty. And so let's look at the first one in verses 12 through 13 of death. <clears throat> when your days are complete, David, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. David, you're going to die, and your death will not break this promise that I'm making to you here right now. Your seed, David, will sit on this throne. This eternal kingdom will not end when you die. This, your, your life, your death is not going to change this promise or this kingdom. And in the very n- near future, Solomon, his son, is going to come and God will choose him to be the one who will build him a temple. Keep moving with me in verse 14. The second one, sin will not break this kingdom. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me, which is very common language for a king in those days. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. This is talking of Solomon. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. 
And so this is so cool is he says, not even sin, David, will cause me to take this kingdom away from you and your descendants. One of your descendants will be sitting upon the throne. And, and what happened with Saul? Saul came and as Saul began to sin, he took it away. Jonathan, his son, did not sit on the throne. It was one and done. Sin took away the dynasty from Saul. So here's David. There's only been one king and sin ended it. And so David, sin isn't going to end my promise to you and your descendants and what I'm going to build. So how can you have a descendant of David then sitting on the throne forever and one of them sins like Saul? How, How do you not end it? Well, as the story progresses, his seed, starting with Solomon, is just full of sin. Solomon is loaded with sin. In 587 BC, the Babylonians come in and they lay the city waste and they take them captive under the Babylonian king because of all the sin. In a few chapters, David himself is going to commit royal rape and murder to cover up his sin. How? How, what are you going to do then? All this sin that's going to flow through the seed of, of David is, is how, how come Saul had it taken away and now there's some promise to you and you're not going to take it away with all the sin that's going to break out in this lineage. Just look how conditional that promise was. I want to read to you from 1 Kings 11. You don't need to turn there. Solomon had married a bunch of foreign wives. He's disobeyed God, and now he's even worshiping their idols. Solomon has drifted far from God. But in verse 11, the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. I'm going to take it from you, Solomon, because of your sin. I'm going to tear it from you. But for the sake of my servant David, he says, I'm going to leave one tribe for your son. And this shows that the the promise to establish this kingdom cannot happen if the descendants are sinners. Solomon, because of your sin, I'm going to pull it away. It was ripped away. And this is just repeated again and again with Israel's history with its kings. I'm just going to read two verses for you. 1 Kings 2, 4. So the Lord, that the Lord may carry out his promise, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their souls, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel, but they've got to walk before me with their hearts and their souls. They, they can't be sinful and wicked. 1 Kings 8, 25. Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him. What we're looking at here saying, you shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your sons take heed to their way to walk before me as you have walked. So Israel learned that when a king was righteous, the nation prospered. And whenever the king was unrighteous, they were destroyed and judged and sometimes taken into captivity. That's the history of Israel then. As every time a king would do well, blessing came. Every time they rejected God and sin, cursing and judgment would come upon them just again and again. And so it's so clear that the promise God made was secure. Three times, this kingship is going to last forever. It's not going to come to an end. It will be forever and ever and ever. But all the kings are sinful and God keeps tearing it. So we just go from one judgment to the next, to exile, to the time of Jesus where there's a Roman king reigning over this nation. But the prophets keep coming and telling Israel there's going to come a son who's good enough. I want you to listen to Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I shall raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. So I'm going to raise up a righteous 
branch who's going to sit on this throne. And he will fulfill the conditions. Just like we saw last time, the seed of Abraham came and fulfilled every condition of the Mosaic Covenant. He came and the conditions were kept by Jesus and he fulfilled everything. And this king is going to need to be perfectly righteous or the kingdom's going to get torn. And that king who's going to come will be called the righteous branch. And then next week, we're going to look at Isaiah 9. I just want to read it for you this week. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over the kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore for all of history, all of eternity. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. God will do this. And so I love this. I want you to just catch this and I'll move on. The covenants in the Old Testament, they come and you hear them and they look very conditional. You got to quit sinning to stay on this throne, to, to be blessed. And, and yet they always have this certainty. I will do it forever. It's forever. It's not going to fail. So how do you have condition and unconditionality come together one way? God is going to fulfill it. And God is going to fulfill his promise to David by a baby who is going to come a thousand years later and be born into Bethlehem. That is how God is going to do it. He does it through his son. And so get this. I will keep the dynasty going. Your house, David, will have a descendant who will sit upon it forever. Even if they sin, I'm making you a promise. Even if they sin, this is going to still come to pass. If your son does evil, I will correct him with the rod of men. He says, I will discipline and chastise him. And we see this, the rest of the history of this line in David's descendants. Temporal affliction due to their sin. But God never diverts his promise or his plan because of the sin of David or his descendants. Why? Because he made a promise to David and he made a covenant. That, that I will bless this. There will always be this seed who's going to rule and reign from your descendants, David. And lastly, uh, come back to verse 16. What is it then that breaks all kingdoms and all dynasties? It's always the passing of time, isn't it? The weakening of the people or the leaders, the other powers come and conquer them or moral decay from the inside brings about destruction. Every human dynasty has risen and fallen. That's the history of the world. Time takes down every dynasty, every one of them. So what is time going to do to this kingdom that God is promising to David? Look with me in verse 16. Your house... And your kingdom shall endure forever, uh, before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And in accordance with all these words and all of this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. And so guys, this is a big promise. There's no hyperbole. This isn't long live the king. May the king live forever. You, you hear that and you see that in all these movies. This isn't hyperbole. This isn't just may you live forever. That is not at all what's going on here. This is literal and it's true. And this kingdom by God's promise will have no end. David, this kingdom's eternal. This is God's promise. It is one that Israel hung its hat on. The rest of their history, they're waiting and they're waiting for this king that God promised. It's one of the main reasons why they missed the Messiah when he came. He's not throwing down all of our enemies. That's why that, the, the, the week before he died, they tried to make him king. Here it is now. Here's David, the king. Let's, let's make him king ourselves. And they're, they're missing it. This promise of God here is so vast and beautiful and eternal, and it's sealed with God's promise. God made it. I will do this. So how can it be fulfilled? How do you fulfill this? There's only two possible ways. 
One, every generation would have a Davidic heir on the throne. Boom, boom, boom for the history of the world, but that ended in 587 BC. So it, it can't be that. There's one other possibility, and that's that the heir of David, he himself would come and sit on a throne, and he would live forever, and then his kingdom would have no end. Amen? That is our blessed hope here this morning. His kingdom will know no end. God began a world in Genesis 1 through 2. And in Genesis 3, we saw a serpent came, the devil, and he tempted Adam and Eve, and they turned from allegiance to God. And when they left, when they fell, everything fell apart. Remember, we saw all creation turned against them, their relationship with God and each other and their creation. Everything changed. And now everything's fallen apart. Sin, racism, sexual perversion, murder, hatred, shame, unhappiness, death spread to all men. When, when it got broken, guys, it broke. And we live in the midst of it now. This whole thing has been destroyed. And the only question then is what will heal it? What will heal it? I want you to turn to Psalm 96. What is going to heal this brokenness of what came when Adam and Eve sinned and we've now been separated from God and we're no longer under His rule and His reign and this world is decaying and falling apart because it wasn't made for this. We were made for God and, and this whole thing is a mess and broken and there's something that can bring it back to order. And I just want you to listen to Psalm 96. A call to worship the Lord, the righteous judge. <clears throat> sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless His name. Proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His glory among the nations, His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and He's greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are their idols. But the Lord is the one who made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. He is the king. He's the ruler. In verse 11 then, as we come under that lordship, let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that it contains. Let the field exult in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest, they're going to sing and they're going to shout for joy. Trees don't do that. They do when they're rightfully under God. Before the Lord, for he's coming, and he's coming to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness, and he will judge the peoples in faithfulness. Kingship just makes everything blossom when it's in its rightful place. When, you, when you're back to what you were made for, to be under God and surrendered in relationship to the King of kings and Lord of lords, it, it orders everything back in this world and in, in your life. Do you see then what David is being told here this morning? The king is Jesus Christ, and it's his kingdom that he is now ruler over and he is building in like leaven, it's spreading and it's going to the nations. So the answer to all of this is the baby that was born in a manger he was the Davidic king, and he came to undo the works of the devil and to bring men back under the rule and the reign of God. And he will sit on a throne uh, right now at the right hand of God, and his kingdom is never going to end. It's going to be forever and ever and ever, and all who are brought into that kingdom will rule and reign with him for all of eternity. That's what God is promising here in our passage. So flip to Matthew 1. 
And then that'll, that'll be our last thought. At least our last verse we're going to look up. I got a few more thoughts. My question is, how do you know then what, what God meant to David? How do we know for sure? And I want you just to come to the very first book of the New Testament and the very first verse to just see, boom, this is what's going on now. Here it is. A thousand years later, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 41 generations, Abraham to Jesus, with very specific names. The God who controlled every seed, every event, every thought for Messiah to come from the line of Abraham and to come from David. Yours is the glory, O Lord. Just marvel at that list of God moving to bring about what he said he would do to Abraham and what he said here to David. Matthew 1.1, this is the fulfillment of the promise that was made to Abraham and David. Matthew will spend a whole gospel showing that this is the king who would come and sit on the throne and whose kingdom would have no end. The king has come. He's going to show the king has accomplished salvation. The king is on his throne and the king is now going to bring in the nations. Go to the nations at the end of the gospel uh, for the great commission. Go into his, this world and bring them into his kingdom by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Guys, this is the fulfillment of all of the Bible and all of the history. This is what was born into Bethlehem's manger. His promises are reliable because he's the sovereign one. David has a descendant who will sit on the throne forever. And therefore, we have a forever salvation. He's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Jesus Christ. He says, fear not, little flock. Your father has gladly given you the kingdom of God, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Here he is, the king that was born in that manger. Amen. I'm going to give you some application. As I was preparing application, I had about three or four, and I came across uh, this gentleman who had six, and so I liked his better. So I'm going to borrow uh, his six points of application and not tell you which ones were similar to me. I liked all six of his. So as we close out, I want you now to say, so what does that mean to me? And, and the biggest thing in Acts 15, if you want to go home, or, or I don't have enough time, just go read Acts 15 where there's the debate, the Gentiles are being saved, why, what? And, and the answer is, this is the Davidic covenant. And now he's building a, a house with Gentile stones. And so what this means to Gentiles here this morning is that this promise of a king to rule and reign over a kingdom forever is by faith you've been brought into this. You've been brought into this rule and reign of the David who's sitting right now on his throne. First, what does that do for me? It gives hope. It gives hope for the world because this kingdom isn't it. Guys, this, this world isn't in. I, I don't want you to think, some people come to Jesus so they can have a better kingdom here. And so that, that, that is not it. What we came to Christ is we've been brought into the kingdom of God. That is what this is all about. I, I'm an American, yes, but my first and foremost, I, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. And we need to think and enter into our kingdom and, and see it with the eyes of Christ and, and, and come and uh, we're about the kingdom of God. This is what our lives are for. This is what we give ourselves to is the king and his kingdom. And so the hope for the world is, is the king has come and anyone who comes to him will be brought into this kingdom. And so we have hope for those in the kingdom of darkness, for the God of this world. So there, there's, there's hope. Hope was born into Bethlehem's manger, and we, we should be telling everybody we can. There's a, there's a kingdom, and this, this, this kingdom's broken because of the devil. Quit trying to make this the kingdom of God. Quit giving all of your energies and powers and efforts to try to build your little paradise here in Denver. The kingdom of God is what we've been brought into, and there's so much hope no matter what you're facing this morning and this kingdom that's going to reign and rule forever. You know, if he was just a savior, that's a very individual thing. If he's a king, the future is not just us, but an eternal heavenly kingdom. 
If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Um, we're, we're in the kingdom of God. And, and so there's a kingdom, and this kingdom is to permeate this world like leaven. And so let, let's, let's get in and, and permeate the kingdom of darkness with the truth that people would come into this great kingdom that the Davidic king is now sitting on this morning. There is so much hope uh, for this world. Secondly, I think it should bring about service that the one who was rich, Jesus, became poor so that we who were poor could become rich. I think I'm going to preach on that on Christmas Eve. J.I. Packer in his great book, Knowing God, uh, said... Um, the meaning, talk about the meaning of Christmas. I'm going to quote him. He says, we talk glibly of the Christian spirit, rarely meaning more than this, than some sentimental feeling, especially for families at the holidays. But the Christmas spirit is not the spirit of Christians. As a last, there are many whose ambition in life is limited to building up a nice middle-class home, making nice middle-class friends, bringing up their children in nice middle-class ways who leave the sub-middle-class parts of their community world to get on by themselves. But the Christmas spirit is rather like their master who lived his whole life on the principle as the one who became poor so that others might become rich. They spend and they are spent giving time, trouble, money, care, and concern to others and not just the people like them, in whatever way there seems to be a need. And so this, this king, we, we learn from him, and now we enter into this world with the heart of Christ to love, care, labor. Here it is, I, I lay myself out for the king who emptied himself and came and died for us. Third, I think that this cries for obedience. If he's a king... We do what he says unconditionally, don't we? And, and what I want you to see is this isn't, I'm a king, just obey me. I'm a king with hands with holes in it and feet that were pierced through for your transgressions. I'm a king that now should take your heart away to full surrender. There should never be a, a, a king that you're more willing to bow and serve than the perfect king that's sitting on David's throne right now. Obedience. If you love me, keep my commandments. I've had people say to me, I tried Christianity and it didn't work. If that's you here this morning, I want to talk to you because I love you. I tried it and it didn't work. Well, thank you for coming back to try again. But what that means to me is I have non-negotiable things in my life that I wanted and I didn't get from Christianity. I wanted happiness and I didn't get it. I wanted health and I got cancer. I wanted to get married and I'm single or divorced and hurting. I came and I, I wanted to get something. And Christianity didn't give it to me, which means this. I obey God if. It's very conditional. I'll obey the king who's sitting on the throne right now with everything under him. Uh, all that's doing is I'm using God. I've come to you to use you for what you can give to me. And so the question this morning with this king, who are you serving? There cannot be an if in the Christian life. And so this morning I've been praying and asking God, I want everyone in this room to drop your if or you are still on the throne of your life. There's no ifs. I want you to come before this king and bow unconditionally everything in your life. Americans have become masters at giving God pieces. This king is saying, I want everything. He's the king. He's the best king. Unconditional allegiance. Is there something this morning you just won't surrender? As your shepherd, I've watched some of you there's just this thing you will not surrender, some of you. And I want you to look at the king on the throne, David, the Davidic king. Is there just something you won't let go of? I want you to surrender to this king. I desire that as we all sit and ponder the incarnation this Christmas, 
It would bring all of us to the Davidic king to give to him what is his. And his rule shall have no end. He reigns over the universe and he reigns over our hearts. Guys, there's nothing that isn't his. There's nothing. So everything that I have is surrendered to him. And he wants, he wants every bit of it. And to quit being stubborn sheep and not giving him everything that he's called for. I, I, I love what, uh, I'll get it, Hudson Taylor. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And, I, and it's, it's a king. He's a king. Fourth, it should bring a trust. A king like this, who has died in your place, and now a father who's working all things for your good, this has to bring a trust. And I love what Martin Luther said. He said, worry is a form of ruling the world. <laughs> I'm king. I'm trying to rule the world. If you are worried or anxious, it's because you know exactly how the world needs to go. And you're afraid God's not going to get it right. And you're worried because God can't get it right the way you can. And so it isn't trust. And what he's asking you as a king is to come under him and trust. He's got you. He's working for your good. Some of you are facing some hard, difficult things this morning. And I just want you to come under this king and trust him. When we see it all from beginning to end, we will understand and praise and worship. Trust. No matter what is facing or what's coming or what you're worried about that might come. I love what Luther said to Melanchthon. Uh, Philip, Philip, cease being king. Quit trying to be a king. We have the king of kings as our Lord and our Savior. Worry and God don't go together. What God has separated, let no man put together. Fifth. I want you to be full of expectation. Come thou long expected Savior. Guys, this morning, this is an incredible promise. His kingdom will have no end. There's, ne there's never been a kingdom like that ever. There'll be no end. Jesus is on his throne and the spread of this kingdom is going forth. This sweet lady in the front that just surrendered her life to Jesus Christ a week ago. I just keep watching one after another bow their knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His kingdom is going forth. We have entered into that purpose then. When he saves us, we enter into the king's purpose to go to the nations and make disciples. He's given us every resource we need for this task, for his kingdom called himself. I love that he doesn't just give you a battery that says, go work for me. He gives you himself and his spirit it says, go now extend the kingdom of God in and through me. You don't build me a kingdom, David. I build a kingdom through you. And we have every resource to go and to do things that I'm afraid of and I would have never done before. And I'll open my mouth to people I would have never done that before. I, I have a great expectation of God and who he is and what he's doing. It's unbelievable to enter into what the king wants to do on this earth in and through us. And he's given us everything for life and godliness. Newton said, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such that none can ever ask too much. Large petitions with thee bring. I, I, I bring large petitions. Because there, there's, there's just none that you could ever ask too much of this king. And then lastly, I, I pray that you would have joy. I pray that you would have joy. Joy to the world, what? The Lord has come. David's king has come and he sat on his throne and his kingdom is going to have no end and he shall reign forever and ever. And if I could sing, I would just scream, hallelujah, hallelujah. It will never end. A billion years from now, he will still be on his throne and our joy will be ever increasing forever and ever where every day will be better than the last. It's no small thing what God gave to the world because he so loved it. 
that Christmas morning, he gave us a king from the line of David who will sit on that throne and he will reign forever and ever. And all of us who have come to Christ are joint heirs with this king. To God be the glory, amen. Before we pray, one last thing is if you've come here and you've come because your life is in disorder, Genesis is the only explanation because God designed it to be beautiful and orderly. I think it was Lewis said, if you can never uh, get happy here on earth, it shows you were made for something greater. And so you've been made for something greater than this kingdom called the world. And God has come and his son has made a way to bring us back and to what he designed us to be surrendered in love with our creator and walking with him and having a relationship. And so his son came into the world and he went up on a cross to receive the justice of God for our sins. And there he received the full wrath of God for what our sins deserve so that ours could be forgiven. And all our sins could be washed away and separated as far as the east is from the west before God. And then he takes you and he wraps you in a, a garment of righteousness of what Jesus did. He kept the law. He, he came and he lived the way the Son of God, a true son, should live. And God will now put that to your account and look at you as if you live that way. And that now can bring you back to have peace with God. And so the reason your life is falling apart is because you won't come under the lordship of God, but you're under your own lordship. And that's why no matter what you try, it's always December, but never Christmas. It's always chasing after the wind and it never satisfies. I have the only thing that will satisfy you and you'll never need water again. You'll never thirst again or hunger. This Christ will fill what your soul is longing for here this morning. So come to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on him and have eternal life. And your life will now be ordered under the King of Kings. And he will begin to bring orderliness and peace and joy into your life as you have relationship with the King of Kings again. That's what Jesus came into the world to do. Now let's pray. Father, I pray if there's a soul in here whose life is disordered and all they're finding is one heartache after another and at one broken relationship after another, one thing that would finally bring joy that didn't, I pray right now that they would lift their eyes to the one seated on the throne of David that they would look to him and see his hands pierce through for their transgressions, that they would believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and be saved. God, I pray you grant them that. And I pray for us as believers. In many areas, our life is disordered, even as believers, because of things we're holding on to that we don't want to bring under your rightful reign. And so God, I pray for every believer here this morning that they would be done with lesser things. God, let them put away these things that they want more than the king. Just repent for the living God and throw them down at your feet and say, you have everything. My thoughts, my plans, my life, my service, my money. Everything I have is yours, God. I pray that anything someone right now is fighting with, that they don't want to let go, God, bring it to repentance. Bring it under your lordship. Let them look at your hands with holes in it and just finally say, why am I holding to this when he held to nothing to come and save me? God, let it, repentance flow like a river through this church. Everything that's been put ahead of you, God, let it be thrown down here this morning at the throne of David. I pray for a massive repentance in every heart to prepare him room. God, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us. His name is The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.